Good day to you. You know, one of my first memories of China when we went there about five years ago was driving from the airport to the city of Shanghai, a monstrous city with 22 million people living in it. 22 million people living in one city, sort of like New York. Except what I remember when we drove through Shanghai was it was like going through a Spider-Man movie. It was skyscraper after skyscraper after skyscraper after skyscraper. And not just any skyscraper, really towering skyscrapers and beautifully lit skyscrapers at the top. They were all lit up with different ways of projecting that light onto the top of the beautifully sculpted buildings to, to present the skyline as a kind of aesthetic. And I was just blown away. I just, I, I remember driving for an hour and it was skyscraper after skyscraper after skyscraper, much bigger than New York. Made New York almost seem like a model railroad station to me, you know, this tiny little miniature thing. And that's hard to do because New York's pretty tall. And so that's my way of saying to you to, in today's class that I was sensing a lot of different things as we went through, as we went through Shanghai. I was sensing lights. I was sensing motion, I was sensing sizes, I was sensing shapes, I was sensing height, I was sensing density, I was sensing a lot of things. At the same time, there were a lot of things that I wasn't sensing. I may not have seen a child on the street. I may not have seen a person get out of their car to help an old lady across the street. There were a lot of things that were going on that I didn't see. And so our way of introducing our subject matter today, which is all about perception, Perception and Intercultural Communication Competence. That's the title of our chapter. Chapter 2, Perception and Intercultural Communication Competence. Our class today is all about perception. And it starts with sensing. It starts with sensing. Sensing is a neurological process. It goes on in the brain. It's, it's a way of, of taking in our surroundings. And we do that through our five senses, right? We've got smell. We've got taste. We've got touch. We've got... Uh, uh, I, I don't remember the eyes and we've got hearing. Yes, yeah, so we've got those five senses that we're taking in the world through all the time. And we're not even necessarily aware that we're doing it because it's a neurological process. It has to do with sound waves in the case of sound being emitted and going across our eardrums and our brain then translating those auditory sounds into electrical impulses. Same kind of process is going on for smelling. You know, the, the molecules are wafting through the air and going through our nose and, and, and stimulating our olfactory systems. That's what sensing all is all about. It's a very primitive kind of thing. It's just simply going on through our bodies as they interact with the environment. Uh, now let's go to the second, the second stage of perception. And that second stage is actually called perceiving. Because after stimulating, you have to consciously make a decision that you're going to attend to a certain stimuli. You're going to pay attention to that skyscraper or that young Chinese child on the sidewalk. You're going to decide to pay attention. And, and it's almost like it brings to the forefront a, a, stimuli, a stimulus in your environment that was there that you weren't even aware of until you perceive it. Like, how many of you knew about the fan in my office? Can you hear it now? That guy over there? Yeah, you hear it now, but it's been going the whole time the video lecture has been on. And so perception is that next act. And it actually takes place over three phases. There are three phases of perception or deciding to focus on a sensation. The first step is selection. So you decide what you're going to focus on. You go into a British pub. I tell you, one of the things that's really amazing that you notice right away is all of the liquor bottles are upside down. Yeah, they pour their mixed drinks very differently in Britain. They're very regimented according to uh, national law, and they have to measure every alcohol serving in centiliters. And so the bottle is upside down, and they have a gadget on the bottom. It's a little pump, and you push the glass up into it, and when it stops pouring, you have exactly the number of centiliters that you need. So it's very easy to get rum, vodka, whiskey, etc. in that system. And so if you go into an English pub as an American, that may be one of the things that you select to focus on right away because it's different, right? Our bottles are upright. It's a very basic difference, up 
versus down. You know, we see these kinds of differences whenever we go to cultures looking at specific objects, up, down, sideways. Those are some of the basic ways we notice differences. You are selecting. It's that first stage of perception. You're selecting to look at the bottles. And then that brings up the second stage, which is organization. And now what you're going to do is you're going to start to put your observations into categories so that you can understand what you selected, so that it doesn't stand out as an, as an isolated instance. Wow, I only saw in Britain that they had their bottles upside down. Oh no, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, there was another place that I saw, where was it? Was I think it was Australia. You think Australia had bottles upside down in their bars. They don't have pubs, they have bars. And then in Canada, I think in Canada, wait a minute, it wasn't in the French part of Canada, it was in the English part of Canada, the Toronto part of Canada. Well, there's a lot of parts that are English, but Toronto is one of them. And they had their bottles up down, so you, upside down. So you know what? Maybe there's a connection between former British countries. Maybe former British countries sell their hard alcohol that way in bars. I'm organizing. I'm organizing these three separate occurrences into categories now. And that's the second step of perception that goes on. And then that leads us to the third and final phase step, whatever you want to call it. And that's interpretation. Interpretation. Interpretation is attaching meaning to what it is that we are observing, what it is that we are selecting, and what it is that we are perceiving. Attaching, what does it mean? What does it mean? You know, a lot of people, for example, they describe, staying with the English pub example, they describe that, uh, that it's their impression that English beer is warm. Um, you know, that's a very interesting way to describe English beer because it's basically saying that you're comparing it to your own beer as an American, which is almost always sold cold. And there is, there's a reason for that. And that's because most American bill, beer is of the lager variety. Although we have seen a recent increase in India pale ales and, and other kinds of ales. But the traditional Budweiser's, and Coors, and all those, those are lagers. And because, a log, uh, because of the composition of a lager chemically, it needs to be chilled. That's how the flavors are unlocked. But other kinds of beers, like ales, which are much more common in England, they are served at 57 degrees. It's, it's known as room temperature. It's slightly less than our room temperature because that is the temperature that is necessary for to unlock the flavors that are inherent to brewing an ale, which is brewed differently from a lager. And so it's not that the beer is warm in England. It's that the beer is warmer. Big difference. It's warmer. This is interpretation, right? This is how we're trying to understand a foreign culture. Because to call a foreign culture's beer warm, right, it's kind of got an insulting quality to it. It's like, yeah, their beer is warm. Who wants that? You know, very different to interpret your selection of stimuli, your organization of stimuli, and then put a kind of, of interpretation on it that is allowing the other culture to have a difference from yours that is not judged as being inferior to your country. That's kind of what we're trying to do in, in this class is intercultural communication because we're trying to develop competencies. That's what this chapter is digging into, to develop competencies so that you're able to go into a country and you're able to navigate your way around and not accidentally offend people. Not that you should always be acting as though you don't want to offend people. I mean, if you want to speak up for yourself and somebody gets offended, that's a perfectly appropriate time to be offensive. But when you go into a country and you start violating customs, deeply held customs, that's something we want to seek to avoid. That's why we have a chapter like this. Before we leave behind perceiving, the book does introduce a theme that we talked about earlier. It's basically taking the world, and the world is full of one culture that's broken up into many cultures, right? And then it's trying to divide it into two general philosophies of thinking about cultures. It's, it's kind of hitting on the theme of Confucianism or Easternism as one philosophy, and then on the other side is Westernism as the other philosophy. And it does talk about, in the area of perception, that what motivates people in interpretation is often a concept known as a high context culture or a low context culture. So let's seek to describe that for a moment. A high context culture means that because the culture has very, very clear messages embedded in its history, that it has a long history of rituals and customs. And because the people are very, very homogenous in that country, that they, there's a lot of likeness between them as opposed to a lot of unlikeness between the way people look, uh, act, etc. Because there's a lot of homogeneity, that means that there's a lot of context. And so the behaviors that are expected of you in a high context culture don't need to be spelled out for you. 
That means that if you walk into a room full of people, nobody needs to say to you, ah, come over here and introduce yourself. It's a situation where you walk in and you know what the protocol is. Again, talking about China, China is a high context culture, very, very um, homogenous peoples. Not a lot of, of peoples came in from other countries to settle China. China is a very hierarchical society, also going along with high context culture. So when you go into a big Chinese room, there is usually going to be a male figure who is the, the esteemed hierarchical male figure. When I was going there, it was for university stuff, so we'd go in and there would usually be a dean, and the dean was always a male. And without being told to go over and pay your respects as soon as you walk in the room, everybody just knows in China. You go in before you sit down, before you put your clothes down, before you put your umbrella down, you go over to the dean's table and you, you, you bow a little bit and, and you shake their hand and, and you act very deferential. It's a high context culture. A low context culture is the opposite. It's where the surroundings don't really provide you with the information of what you're supposed to do. And so the communication has to be specific about what you're supposed to do. Like when you go to get a driver's license, you go to get a driver's license at one of these driver centers across Pennsylvania. They have all kinds of different functions. They got people who are there to take the driver's exam. They got others there who are just to get a duplicate um, driver's license. You got other people there taking care of registration. You got people doing motorcycle license. You got all these counters, right? When you walk in there, they have to have a front desk. The front desk is there. What are you here for? Take a number. What are you here for? Uh, okay, driver's license. Okay, go stand in that line and wait for your number to be called. Very, very specific. And that kind of speaks to the U.S. in general. We are a low context culture, in part because we're a newer country, only 250 years old or so, in part because we also have many, many peoples from other parts of the world, so we don't have a lot of homogeneity, but we are a low context culture. So to bring this back to perception, Perception has a lot to do with whether you go into a country and it's high context or low context because if you are a person who is in a high context cu culture, you're going to be looking for your perception to be directed at the finer background of the culture. If you're in a low context culture, you're going to be looking for somebody's communication specifically to tell you what to do. Now to bring it back to Eastern and Western or Confucianism and Western, Confucianism, Eastern countries are more high context cultures. And so there's a lot of a lot of communication that goes on that's not direct. Like you don't necessarily say you're sorry in a in a culture like that. You just act like you're sorry. Um, in a US culture it's more direct. I'd like to apologize to you. All right, I'd like to move on now to the second main concept in our chapter today and that is developing intercultural communication competence. And by the way, it's not just to allow you to go to another country so that you can communicate with people who look and feel and sound very different from you, from you. It's also so that you can interact with people who come here. If you sit down next to somebody in class and you see somebody wearing an Indian turban, are, are you going to be able to have a conversation? I mean, why shouldn't you be able to do that? You shouldn't be avoiding that simply because you have no idea what to say and you're so afraid that if you say something that might violate their religious belief or their a custom for their country, from their country, or you might say something that shows your ignorance, that's no way to get about in this world. We want to have interactions with people. It makes life so, so much more fulfilling. So we want to make sure that we develop intercultural communication competencies. We want to be competent in our ability to communicate with others from other cultures. And the first area that this has to do with is encoding and decoding. Now this does go back to the last chapter. It developed the last chapter, chapter one, developed a model of communication with a sender and a receiver and a message and context and feedback. You've had that in other communication classes, I'm pretty sure. What this particular concept, encoding and decoding, does is it focuses in on that part of the model and it says the way that we put what we want to say into a code and the way that we, on the other end, if we're receiving communication, take the message and decode it into meaning, those are two areas of competence that we need to develop. Again, to talk about the French example yesterday, if you have to go into a post office, for example, or a store, or anywhere in France that has that kind of shopkeeper look to it, you know that you're supposed to go up to the counter and say, bonjour, comment ça va, before you ask for something, the price of something, or before you hand your goods over to be purchased. 
Okay, that is a way of encoding your communication. You are deciding to say to the person, okay, I'm going to give you a greeting first and then let's get down to business. I am encoding that. So if you know that you're not supposed to, according to French culture, go into a store and just say, can I see that one in the back? That's, that's not the way it goes. That's, you know that how to encode your message. The backside is decoding. The backside is, is decoding. You know, in China, when I was trying to go anywhere, people were constantly pushing their elbows into me and passing by. They're like this, even if you're on the escalator. <laughs> you know, there's people everywhere in China. It's so dense. I mean, it's got 1.3 billion people in it, 1.3 billion people, more people in China than anywhere else in the world. And China is a smaller country, by the way, than the US. The US is the third biggest country. It goes Russia, Canada, US, and then China is the fourth. So China has way more people. The US has 330 million people. The China has 1.3 billion people, and it's smaller than the US. So there's people everywhere. So that culture has developed just out of necessity. You don't have time to stop and say, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, did you mind if I just get by here? You don't have time to do that. You just you know, in Mexico, it's always permiso, permiso. If you want to get past it, con permiso. You, you say, excuse me, may I have your permission to get past you? China, no way. So to see that as an American, I might say, Chinese are rude. Man, they are rude. I can't believe they just go. It's not that way. I'm decoding it differently because I have some sense of knowing about Chinese culture that it's just a practical solution to trying to get by in a country with 1.2 billion people. Now let's move on to the second area of intercultural communication competence. This is what we call personality. And you know, I'm not that thrilled with the use of this concept in the book. I do understand what it's trying to get at. It's speaking to a person's individual personality, which is made up of a whole bunch of factors like your self-concept. Like, are you a confidence person? Are you a person who feels insecure? Are you cocky? Are you a person that is really intimidated? They're all speaking to kind of the same dimensions of your self-concept that then influences how you speak, right? Like people who generally are intimidated or are insecure, they don't speak as much as people who are confident or cocky, if you want to call them that. Another element of personality is self-disclosure. You know, what do you tell about yourself? You know, business people, um, when Americans meet Japanese and they go to Japan, you can expect two days of just getting to know each other's families and going golfing before you even start to talk about business, almost similar to France, right? On the shopkeeper level. And so what we're talking about here is self-disclosure. When do you start talking about yourself? When do you start talking about your family? When do you start reveal, oh, I've, I've been in Japan once before. Oh, uh, I'm divorced. Or, oh, um, last year I was out of work because I had back surgery. When do you, when do you start telling these things, that's also a very important part of, of intercultural communication competence. Different cultures have different expectations for that. You don't want to start self-disclosing in Japan very early makes people uneasy. <clears throat> and then there's also two other elements I'll briefly mention that go along with personality. One is self-monitoring. That means your ability to monitor yourself. You know, some people are totally unaware of how their ex facial expressions look. Well, what do you mean you think I'm pissed off? I'm, I'm really happy. Why do you think I'm pissed off? Well, it's because your facial expression is looking like that. And so self-monitoring, it's not just the ability to look at your face, but it's the ability to, to decide when you have you know, gone too far or haven't gone far enough or whether you could have been more sensitive or whether you were sensitive enough or whether you're a funny person, you know, all of that is self-monitoring. And then the final concept that goes with personality is social relaxation. And that's your ability to just feel okay in another culture, to feel comfortable. You know, when you arrive in a train station in Europe and there's people going all around, there's calls for trains, to last call, last chance to get on board, and then there's the sounds of the trains pulling away. That's a very different environment than what we're used to. Can you get yourself relaxed in that kind of environment? Can you get yourself relaxed in Bangkok in the middle of the city? Can you get yourself relaxed in a, in a desert in the Middle East? Can you get yourself relaxed in the, in the jungle in Panama? These are questions that have to do with intercultural communication competence. Now it takes us next to the third area of intercultural communication competence. We've talked competence. We've talked about encoding, decoding is one area. Personality is a second. This one here is really what this field of mine is all about. It's communication skills. Listening, speaking, writing, organizing, empathizing. There's a lot that goes on with communication very much based on a rhetorical tradition found in ancient Greece that we still practice today. Persuasion at the heart of the rhetorical tradition 
tradition, the ability to, to persuade others, to influence their opinions and beliefs, to go into the Irish countryside and say, isn't the green on that hillside magnificent? That's a green that I've never seen in another country. Isn't that magnificent? To make that comment to a fellow backpacker you're with, you're trying to convince them to see the same when they may have been looking at the coast. They have been, may have been looking at the ocean, but you want them to emphasize the greenness, which is something that Ireland is known for. So there's a whole range of communication skills that go with trying to enact your own intercultural communication competence, and that really is what this course is all about. And then we have the next item, which is called psychological adjustment. And it has to do with being able to get used to things as being different, not being able to have the things the way that you were. You know, when I see Americans go abroad, some of the things that they get annoyed with are they're not able to use their hair dryers sometimes. And in fact, Europeans don't use hair dryers anywhere near as much as Americans do. So that's one thing that's kind of irritating. And then there's also the idea that the use of space is much different as well. There's much space devoted to individual residences and a lot much more space that's devoted to public parks and public spaces in general in Europe. So that takes a, get a, a, bit, of get a, a, a bit of getting used to is if you're staying there, staying in smaller quarters, you feel more claustrophobic. And then there's little things like, you know, you go to McDonald's here or any fast food restaurant, you get, alt, uh, you get unlimited ketchup packs, but you pay two pence, which is like four cents in England for those. So that's different, you know, or you order a soda and there's, there's no ice in it or just two cubes, you know, adjustment, psychological adjustment, feeling okay, saying, you know what, I don't need to have Doritos every day with my lunch. These potatoes that I'm getting in Sweden, okay, I'm used to them now. It's okay. That's another part of, of communication, of intercultural communication competence. And then finally, we come to cultural awareness. That is being aware of dimensions of another culture that they exist and appreciating those differences. And they exist on three different levels. This is according to a model developed by two researchers called Chen, C-H-E-N, Chinese name, and Sarosta, S-A-R-O-S-T-A-S. I'm not sure what that name is. That sounds sounding Spanish to me. Chen and Sarostas, they have a model from 1996. And they say that if you want to develop cultural awareness to really try to study another culture and become aware of it and appreciative of it, you look at the affective nature of that culture. Affective has to do with the culture's emotions. What emotions is that culture comfortable expressing? Crying, laughter, resentment, hypocrisy. You know, there's hundreds of emotions. What emotions? That's what we pay attention to when we're looking at cultural awareness in the affective area. The second area is cognitive. How does a culture think? You know, looking at, looking at cows crossing the road in starving India, it would be very easy to say, eh, these people, what's the matter with them? They can feed themselves. There's a cow right there. You can get milk from a cow. You can get steak from a cow. You can get roast beef from a cow. You can get a lot of things from a cow. Why won't they eat cows? Well, it's against the Hindu religion. Why don't we eat horses? Why do the French eat horses? Okay, so... Let's understand the thinking process, right? The thinking process in our culture is we do not eat domesticated animals. That's a thinking process that may not exist in Hindu Indian culture. We don't eat animals that have been, have been bred over the years to be in captivity and be taken care of by human beings. But then again, we kind of do with chickens. So how is our thinking process? How can you actually explain that we eat chicken, but we don't eat horses or rabbits very much? or squirrels very much, unless you live in a frontier place in West Virginia, for example. You know, the thinking process, we may not come up with the ability to understand the thinking process, and that's okay, but that's what we're trying to do, and that's what makes you competent interculturally. And then lastly, we come to the behavioral dimension. The behavioral dimension of understanding another culture is the kinds of practices that they do. Why is it that when English shake their hands, you know, very, very limp wrist, uh, why is it when a Mexican says that they're going to come by tomorrow, they don't come, but they come the next day? What's that all about? And they act as if nothing's wrong. You know, this is behaviors. Well, guess what? In Mexico, time is a cycle. It goes around and around and around. Hey, we didn't see each other today at one o'clock? No problem. There's another one o'clock coming tomorrow because the sun goes around the world. So we'll do it mañana, tomorrow. The thinking process evolves into a behavior Understanding the behavior is not being rude. Understanding the behavior is being part of the culture that helps us with our confidence. Now I'd like to move beyond those concepts to move into talking about some remaining concepts for our discussion today, including the third culture. 
This is a kind of an interesting concept. I'm not actually sure that it's easy to put it into an actual uh, visual example, um, but it's the idea that of a third culture. And this is that two people from two different cultures come together and they form something more than just fusing together. They form a brand new kind of culture. And I was trying to think about how to embody this and I kind of thought about Puerto Rico. You know, Puerto Rico is Hispanic, but it's also an American commonwealth. You live in Puerto Rico, you can emigrate to the U.S., no problem. Mexicans can't do that. Puerto Ricans, because it has uh, U.S. Commonwealth status, you can do that. You can vote an election if you're Puerto Rican. But are Puerto Ricans American? No. Are they Spanish? No. They are something else. They are, in short, Puerto Ricans. And so it's a third culture that you could say emerged from two other cultures. And then we have the concept of multiculturalism. Multiculturalism is the, uh, the ability to respect cultural differences in the way that people look, in the way that people act, the way that people behave, the way that people make noises. All of that is about multicultural understanding. It's recognizing the world is made up of many cultures. There's no one that's superior than the other, but we need to be able to appreciate. When you see a Muslim sitting next to you in class and they're wearing the, uh, I can't remember the name of the burqa, they're wearing the burqa, similar to the Indian turban, are you going to be able to sit next to them and say, you know what, this person has every right in this world to pursue life according to how they want to believe and how they want to dress, as long as it's not harming other individuals, taking other individual liberties away, etc. They have the right to do that, and that's perfectly fine with me. And I hope that they're looking at me in my turquoise t-shirt and my windblown hair from the rain and saying, yeah, I feel the same. That person has, that's what we're stri striving for in multiculturalism. We even have an office of multiculturalism here at ESU to try and ensure that that happens because we do have racial, racial differences on campus. We have, we have African Americans, we have uh, Caucasians, we have multiracial people, we have Hispanic people, Latino people, Latina people, it's male versus female, uh, and, and other ethnicities, ethnicities that I'm leaving out right now, including Saudi Arabians right now, which is our second biggest student group on campus from another country, we have an office of multiculturalism to try and help us celebrate those differences. All right, and then that takes us to our second and last concept, which is post-ethnic culture. Post-ethnic culture is really the idea that what we've talked about beforehand is kind of irrelevant if you subscribe to this concept because it's saying we all really live in many different groups. You know, for myself, to be egocentric here for a moment, I do live in many different cultural groups. You know, when I go to Britain, I feel very British. I kind of look like a lot of people, especially if you go to Scotland. People in Scotland are short like me, five foot six, kind of have, you know, generally speaking, the same body build. Um, I love the cheeses. I like a lot of things about Scotland. But then I come back to Pennsylvania and, you know, Phillies, yeah, Philadelphia Eagles, yeah, Pocono Mountains, love the Pocono. Two different groups. You know, you have the same. You go between all these groups, you go to your church, that's one group. You go to hang out with your friends, that's another group. You go to, to your workplace, that's another group. And then those groups are representative of a larger group, like your friends are a larger group of you know, whatever you have in common. Maybe it's sports, maybe it's ethnicity, whatever. So post-ethnic post culture is that we're not really confined to one culture, that we can exist in many different cultures. And then that takes us to the very final concept, which is intercultural communication ethics, which is a really unclear part of the chapter. And so I really would like to elaborate on this with just my thinking here to say that what we're trying to say is that the ethics of intercultural communication is not to judge. That's really what we're trying to get at here. It's hard. It's hard, right? If you see, for example, when I go to Mexico and I see a 54-year-old woman get off of a bus, eat a candy bar, and then drop the trash on the ground, I'm freaking pissed off because I don't like people to litter. I think it's, you know, crime to scar the environment like that. I got to really wrap my head around that and really say to myself, you know, she's doing it because every other woman her age in Mexico is doing that because it's not a culture that has had sanitation disposal, garbage trucks, until very, very recently. So it's still a process of education, getting the population to realize that dropping trash is not an acceptable thing. That's what intercultural communication ethics is about, is trying to remove yourself from saying, oh, that Mexican lady, she's a lower person than me. She's worse than me. And trying to say, okay, I understand what's going on. I don't like it, but I'm able to separate between it being her and it being representative of the culture. So that wraps up our second chapter on perception and intercultural communication competence. Have a great day.